Well, thank you. Thank you, Max, for the invitation. Thank you um, for showing up in person. Um, I, I've heard this is the first in-person uh, talk you guys have had for uh, in probably a while. Um, and while I don't mind having people watching um, remotely, it's nice to not be talking to a completely empty room. Um, what you will discover is, while hopefully I do know something about alternative splicing and alternative polyadenylation, I know much less about PCs and working all of the um, various things here. So uh, hopefully I won't shut us down and hopefully we will keep, keep on with the presentation. Um, so as Max said, my uh, interest for many years has been at this interface of RNA processing and the immune system. So, so why are these two things of interest and, and why study them in combination? So as many of you might know, and I think certainly the past two years has, um, has reminded all of us, uh, the immune system is a very complex system. It's comprised of multiple cell types, B cells, T cells, macrophages, monocytes, each of which respond to different sorts of stimuli, be those virus or bacterial pathogens, um, various uh, processes that your own body might create during a disease, et cetera. So you have these multiple cell types, they have multiple specificities depending on the pathogen. And depending on the pathogen, those different cell types have to respond differently. So you have a system in the immune system, um, you have a situation where cells have to respond very precisely and very robustly to a variety of different stimuli. So how do they achieve that? Well, one mechanism is through RNA-based gene regulation. And why would this make sense? Well, RNA-based gene, gene regulation, as I'll elaborate in a few minutes, has the potential, as Max pointed out, to expand our coding potential, take a relatively limited number of genes and expand to many distinct protein functions, um, as well as control and alter protein expression in response to different needs. So depending on the stimuli, a cell may need a different type of protein being expressed and RNA-based gene regulation is one way to do that. So there are two predominant mechanisms of gene regulation I'm going to talk about today, alternative splicing and alternative polyadenylation. <coughs> so alternative splicing essentially is the inclusion or skipping of particular exons or regions of genes um, following initial transcription. So you get an, an initial transcript that has exons, which will be part of the mRNA, as well as introns that have to be removed. This can occur in different patterns, again, where a particular exon or a portion of an exon is included or skipped. And as you might imagine, these then generate different mRNAs that give rise to different proteins because there's a different open reading frame. We now know that almost all mammalian genes undergo some form of alternative splicing, of at least 95%. And that in the vast majority of these cases, the alternative splicing pattern affects the open reading frame, so therefore impacts the um, protein which is expressed. So for the purposes of this talk, we're not gonna get into the deep mechanisms of alternative splicing or splicing in general. But what you do need to understand is that this process of intron recognition and removal occurs through the activity of a multi-component complex called the spliceosome. And that is assembled de novo on each intron. And these are just the various building blocks, U1, U2, U4, 5, 6. These assemble on an intron through multiple weak RNA-RNA, protein-protein, and protein-RNA interactions. And the reason that is important is because the basic recognition and removal of an intron is therefore determined not just by the activity of the spliceosome, but by a myriad of RNA binding proteins that associate with the transcript along the exons as well as the introns and either sterically occlude or help to recruit 
um, the splices home complex. So it's really the combinatorial activity of these various RNA binding proteins, which one is expressed in a particular cell type, their relative abundance of one protein to another that ultimately are going to determine whether a particular exon is included or skipped. So that's a basic primer on alternative splicing. What about alternative polyadenylation? So this refers to the differential site of cleavage and polyadenylation. So transcripts, again, as I think you are um, probably all familiar with, almost all human mRNAs get polyadenylated following transcription. And that occurs by a co-transcriptional cleavage of the nascent RNA, followed by the addition of a poly-A tail. So alternative polyadenylation actually has nothing to do with the process of polyadenylation, that is the addition of the adenylation tail. Rather, it has to do with where the nascent RNA is cleaved. And so what this does is that, <coughs> for instance, in one case, cleavage might occur in a more proximal location, leading to a shorter three prime UTR, whereas in an, under a different condition, cleavage might occur more at a more distal location, leading to a longer three prime UTR. So this is all after the stop codon, so after the translation of the protein. So why does it matter? It matters because three prime UTRs are the sites of interaction of microRNAs and various regulatory RNA binding proteins that control either translation, so therefore protein abundance, protein localization, especially in the case of neurons, as well as some recent data showing regulation of protein activity. And so it follows then that the choice in where the poly A tail is added can um, relieve the, the control of all of these factors, say if the, these microRNAs and RNA binding proteins bind to the dark blue region, if the message is cleaved more proximally, those messages are no longer under that control, right? So, and again, just like with um, splicing, cleavage and polyadenylation are mediated by a complex of factors. Again, the details aren't important for this talk. We can generally think of them as cleavage and polyadenylation factors or CPAFs. But importantly, these are also um, brought together through a set of relatively low affinity or weak protein-protein or protein-RNA interactions. And so again, what this means is that the recruitment of the CPAFs to a particular site to mediate cleavage can be regulated by the presence and activity of RNA binding proteins that either promote recruitment of this complex or sterically occlude. <clears throat> and so in sum, it's the control of, of alternative splicing and alternative polyadenylation through the activity of these RNA binding proteins that are ultimately going to impact um, protein expression and protein function in a way that potentially could give rise to some of this functional um, com complexity or responsiveness in the immune system. So theoretically, that makes sense. You have a complex system that needs to respond. You have a set of mechanisms that allow for complex responses but are these things really connected? And this is something my lab um, sort of set out to address uh, many years ago, actually, when I was uh, ending my postdoc and starting uh, as a PI, which is, as Max counted, was way too many years ago. Um, but the first question that we really wanted to ask were, are these processes of alternative splicing and alternative polyadenylation sensitive or changing in response to immune stimuli? So we've done this over the years in a number of different ways. I'm going to show you some of our most recent data, but, but the conclusion has just been the same. As technology has improved, our, our numbers have improved, um, but the bottom line is the same and the bottom line is yes, both of these systems respond, which is why I'm up here talking. So the system that we've done a lot of work in is um, T-cell activation. 
And uh, again, we don't need to go into the details of T cell activation other than to say your T cells are, are a first layer of your adaptive immune response. Um, recognize and, uh, and set off the immune um, trigger in the body in response to a particular stimuli. And that stimuli is seen through um, the interaction of the T cell receptor with the antigen in the context of an antigen presenting cell, along with the co-stimulatory signal that is recognized by the receptor CD28. So this tells the cell that it's seeing um, a, a, some, a foreign entity that it needs to respond to. That sets up extensive proliferation and um, changes in gene expression that set up effector functions, be it cytokine expression, um, migration to sites of infection, et cetera. And then eventually uh, these cells differentiate either into memory cells or they undergo apoptosis in what's called activation-induced cell death. So we've taken this system um, using primary naive T cells from human donors. We can activate these cells through the CD3, which is the T cell receptor, and the CD28 uh, receptors through the use of antibodies. And we've done this um, looking at both the normal co-stimulatory um, uh, situation, which most closely mimics normal T cell activation, um, but we've also used these controls, CD3 stimulation or CD28 alone. We then harvest these cells after various time points, isolate RNA, carry out deep uh, sequencing using RNA-seq, and um, assess various um, parameters of uh, gene expression through various pipelines. So to look at alternative splicing, we collaborate with a colleague at UPenn to use a um, pipeline called Magic. And what this uh, uh, data revealed is that we identify over a thousand alternative splicing events that change robustly in response to this T cell activation. What I'm mapping here is, is a time course, as you might imagine, some of these Changes occur fairly early after stimuli. These would be the most direct effects. Some of those then uh, return to baseline over time, whereas others remain um, altered. And then some of these in black are the late changes that where we see relatively no effect early upon stimulation, um, but see large changes in splicing after. This uh, graph I'll just highlight uh, is looking at what we call delta psi or PSI. That is uh, what psi stands for is percent inclusion or percent spliced isoform. So in essence, any place where that number is going positive, we are seeing increased inclusion of a particular exon or a piece of an exon, whereas a negative delta psi indicates increased skipping of a particular part of the mRNA. And that's a metric you'll see throughout the talk. <laughs> so one question we've had is um, whether these fall into different functional categories. The short answer is yes. Um, and that the, the earliest, the genes that change splicing most rapidly upon T cell activation are those involved in RNA processing, whereas genes that exhibit later changes in splicing um, more closely relate to metabolism and especially nucleic acid metabolism. And that is likely consistent with um, rapid, the need for rapid changes in gene expression, hence RNA processing, followed by longer term need for increased um, proliferation. You need more nucleotides, DNA and RNA to undergo replication and undergo increased um, overall uh, gene expression and proliferation. The other thing we've looked at in these experiments is how co-stimulation impacts um, the ultimate uh, changes in gene expression. So again, um, cells can be stimulated by CD3 alone, but usually that leads to um, a, a incomplete activation and actually a, a, a situation we refer to as anergy where cells um, more or less uh, 
sort of stop what they're doing. And the co-stimulatory -stimula signal really is what's needed for full activation. So we were interested in whether that contributes to the change in splicing. At a gross level, what I'm showing um, in the bottom left here is that we see relatively good correlation in the change in splicing, seeing whether we do or do not include co-stimulation, meaning that in general, CD3 activation alone is sufficient to get the changes in splicing that we see. <clears throat> However, for a portion of genes, about a third of the genes early um, following activation and a smaller percent later in activation, we do observe that co-stimulation changes the degree of the alternative splicing by at least twofold. And so what that means is it's consistent with this notion that triggering through CD3 gives you a certain level of activation, but to get really full robust activation, you need CD28 co-stimulation. And this would argue that some of these genes at least are involved in that particular co-stimulatory uh, response. And we'll come back to that at the very end of the talk. Yeah. Is that sure. Correct. We haven't really done that analysis. Um, at this point, so much is known. There, there are very few that are truly novel anymore and that as um, more and more data gets deposited um, from more and more tissues, uh, I think we know most of the alternative splicing patterns. So there's, um, I, perhaps what you're asking is how many are zero? Right. Um, again, I can't give you the full numbers, but for the most part, these ones that are changing never go all or none one way or the other. They're, um, they tend to be in the sort of 20 to 80% uh, mid-range. And so you're seeing shifts in the balance, if that answers your question. And, and you'll see some examples of that as, as we go on. So similarly, we took the same data set and analyzed it with a pipeline called DEPARS, which looks at alternative polyadenylation. And we see a very similar thing, that is several thousand genes, which undergo changes in the site of polyadenylation um, for the most part. So again, what we're looking here is a, a metric looking at the distal to the proximal use. And the shift strongly to the negative here indicates a global shortening of three prime UTRs. And this is consistent, as I'll show you with a sec in a second, with much older data that was lower throughput published um, by Chris Burgess lab a number of years ago. And again, we see that for the most part, CD3 stimulation um, shifts things in a similar manner, but uh, to perhaps not quite the same full extent that we see uh, during co-stimulation. And again, as I said, this um, global shortening of three prime UTRs is something that has been reported previously during T cell activation in a, a older, lower throughput um, uh, set of experiments uh, from Chris Burge's lab. But again, the, the model holds true that upon proliferation and upon activation, T cells, as well as many other cell types, undergo a global shortening. And this is thought to remove uh, control by microRNAs, allowing for more rapid proliferation. Okay, so we know now that the basic hypothesis is true, that there's changes in splicing and polyadenylation upon T cell activation. And so this sets up sort of the two big driving questions in my lab. The first is what are the mechanisms, proteins, and pathways by which antigen signaling regulates this, these processing events? And then secondly, um, how do these processing events ultimately contribute to immune cell function? And so I'm going to tell you two uh, short stories today. 
One has to do with junk signaling and the RNA binding protein self-2, which work um, from a former student in the lab, Nicole Martinez, who's now a professor at Stanford, as well as a postdoc and my lab manager, um, have shown that this pathway regulates both splicing and polyadenylation uh, in response to T-cell activation. And then I'll end with um, more recent work from Davia Blake, a current student in the lab, um, who is studying how this um, regulation affects apoptosis. Okay, so to really get at mechanism, we have left primary cells because they're a pain to work with in terms of real biochemistry and have moved to a jerket cell system where we've looked at, um, can we mimic these same T cell activation events? And the short answer is yes, using a uh, targeted RNA sequencing approach in collaboration with Zhang Gang Fu at UCSD. Uh, we did a, a method called RazzleSeq and identified about 500 genes now that undergo changes in T cell signal induced um, alternative splicing in this jerkit model system. We can repeat this with inhibitors of various pathways. And I know this is a complex uh, thing and I've lost my pointer, there it is. Um, a complex set of data here on the left, but in short, the colors on the far left indicate the degree of inclusion or skipping of a particular exon. And then any place where the color is the same across the various rows, that is an event that was um, required signaling in that pathway or through that pathway in order to induce change. And so this is just simply to say that there are many different changes that occur and there's a different degree to which various pathways um, impinge and impact those events. What this data allowed us to do though was, was start to cluster co-regulated uh, splicing events. And um, we particularly were interested in junk because that was a pathway that regulated about 25% of the overall changes that we saw um, during T cell activation. And when we gathered these co-regulated genes together, what we found is that most of these junk um, responsive exons uh, were flanked by UG rich sequences. So we wanted to really understand what was the mechanism driving this, um, these splicing events. And so to do that, we took a particular model system that is the regulated splicing in the gene encoding MKK7. <coughs> so this gene has a alternative exon two that is um, in naive cells. And this goes back to your question, in naive cells, we see about an equal distribution between exon inclusion and exon skipping, but upon activation of either primary cells or the jerket cell line, we get a shift toward more skipping of the exon, um, leading to a, a favoring of the smaller isoform. And again, that is dependent on junk signaling as shown in the far left. So the reason this gene um, really caught our attention is because MKK7 encodes a MAP or is a MAP kinase that itself is responsible for junk signaling. That is MKK7 phosphorylates junk to propagate subsequent um, junk signaling to activate junk. And so what we found is that the larger isoform in, well, let's start with the, the smaller isoform, um, is the version of the protein that associates very efficiently with junk. It has a docking domain, which, which fits into a binding pocket in junk, um, which is required for uh, efficient phosphorylation of junk. But the larger isoform encodes uh, an added peptide sequence, which embeds within the docking domain, disrupts the ability of MKK7 to interact with junk, and in fact, drives MKK7 to phosphorylate other types of, or other proteins, other um, signaling events, um, but does not propagate junk signaling. So what this means is that the model is that the change in MKK7 splicing that we see in response to initial signaling, 
propagates um, subsequent junk uh, downstream signaling events. So you get a little bit of MKK7 activity, it phosphorylates junk that initiates the splicing event. You now get more of the small isoform, you get more phosphorylation of junk, and we can show in data I'm not, um, I don't have time to show today, that this augments or enhances subsequent junk uh, signaling and downstream gene activation. Okay, so, so we know that this event is responsive to junk. We know that junk regulated exons, including MKK7, are flanked by UG rich sequences. So are those important for regulation and what do they bind to? And so as a first step to that, we took a mini gene approach where this is just, I'm showing the um, quantification of the splicing change of MKK7, the endogenous gene. Um, and then next to it, the fact that if we make a mini gene that contains just the regulated exon and flanking intron, that is sufficient to get a similar degree of responsiveness of splicing um, in response to uh, cell signaling that we mimic here with PMA of um, the, uh, the jerket cells. And indeed, if we just include the UG rich containing intronic sequences, so we, we substitute out the exon, that is also sufficient to get the full extent of uh, gene expression change. And so that tells us that these sequences are necessary and sufficient. So what is binding to them? To answer that question, we used a UV cross-linking assay. This is one of my favorite assays since I was a PhD student, where one takes radio-labeled RNA, incubate it with extracts from cells, um, either from resting or stimulated conditions, then uh, use UV light to induce covalent crosslinks, and then digests up all of the RNA and runs an SDS page gel. And what you get is a banding pattern of proteins that are light up for radio, radiography um, because they are covalently linked to a radio labeled bit of RNA. And so what we were excited to find um, was a whole pattern of proteins that cross-linked to these um, regulatory sequences in, in an inducible way upon T-cell activation. So again, comparing the activated extracts from activated cells versus uh, naive or resting cells. And again, in data, I don't have time to show, we identified what all of these proteins are through um, the use of antibodies and, and IP experiments, and then tested for their functional relevance. So some of these are just binding because RNA binding proteins like to bind to RNA. It doesn't mean that these proteins necessarily impact splicing. Um, but SELF2 in particular caught our attention because it was a known regulator of alternative splicing, specifically in heart and muscle development. But we had previously shown that it was also regulated during T cell development um, in addition to T cell activation. And so indeed, if we knock down SELF2, shown here on the left, we lose exon repression under both resting and stimulated conditions, and most importantly, we no longer see the robust um, uh, reduction of inclusion of the exon that, uh, upon PMA stimulation that we normally do in wild type cells. Whereas knockdown of other proteins that bound to these sequences had essentially no effect on the splicing. So depletion of self 2 essentially abrogates all of the repression of this exon. And excitingly, we could also show that this protein increased, increases in expression quite dramatically upon T cell activation. And this is totally dependent on junk signaling. If we knock down junk with an shRNA or inhibit with a chemical inhibitor, we again lose all expression of self 2 So this is linking junk signaling with self 2 expression ultimately with exon skipping. And so that's just diagrammed here where 
Um, what we envision happening is initial signaling occurs um, through the small amount of the small isoform of MKK7, which is present in naive cells. This leads to increased junk activation, which increases the expression of self 2 And again, in data, I don't have time to show. We know now that that's through an increase in mRNA stability. That then allows self 2 levels to build up to a level at which it can bind to these UG-rich sequences around the exon and induce exon skipping, leading to more of the small isoform and eventually more um, uh, funneling through the junk uh, signaling pathway. <coughs> and as I said, MKK7 was only one of many genes that were both junk responsive and are flanked by UG-rich sequences. So we also went back and did RNA-seq analysis after knockdown of self 2 and what we found was that about a third of the junk responsive sequence, junk responsive exons are also responsive to self 2 suggesting that at least a third, perhaps more of these junk responsive events are being regulated through this junk self 2 axis. So part of trying to, to sort of nail that down and, and provide more data to support that model uh, we carried out a CLIP-seq analysis. So this is a UV cross-linking in cells. So we're now trapping protein RNA um, complexes that are occurring in the jerket cells um, during resting or stimulated conditions. And um, what we found is, con again, consistent with the model, is that SELF2 was cross-linking or binding um, around these junk-regulated exons. But that wasn't the most interesting part of that experiment. The most interesting part was that while we did find binding around introns or onto introns, the vast majority of the self 2 binding was occurring in three prime UTRs. And this was particularly surprising to us because while self one its homolog is known to bind three prime UTRs and stabilize messages in the cytoplasm. Self two, we really mostly, if not only, see in the nucleus. So there was very little expression of self two in the cytoplasm. So this then caused us to wonder what is self two doing binding so, so extensively to three prime UTRs? And again, remember I told you that we, also knew about the same time that there was extensive um, regulation of alternative polyadenylation, which occurs in the nucleus co-transcriptionally during these same stimuli, PMA stimulation of jerket cells, junk signaling, et cetera. So this then caused us to want to ask whether self 2 in addition to regulating splicing, which it had already been described to do prior to our linking it to junk signaling, might it also be regulating polyadenylation? Now, I told you earlier that you don't need to worry about the details of, um, of all of these components of the polyadenylation machinery for the purposes of this talk, and that's true. But what you should notice is that many of them bind to these GU or UG rich elements that I just told you are a binding site for self 2 And so, that then caused us to wonder whether self 2 might be also binding to these elements in a manner which is competitive which, with the polyadenylation machinery. And so in particular, the factors within the polyadenylation machinery that bind to these elements is a protein called CF1M25 and a protein called CSTF64. So first, let me show you that um, this, uh, so we wanted to know whether uh, self 2 might be competitively binding with these factors. The first question was, we know it's binding to three prime UTRs, but is it binding particularly 
around polyadenylation sites? And the answer is yes. So this is just a map of um, the density of SALT2 binding across a three prime UTR. As a control, this protein HNRMPL, which is another RNA binding protein, which is known to coat um, three prime UTRs, really shows essentially an even distribution across an entire three prime UTR. But SELF2 really shows this peak of binding just upstream from known polyadenylation sites. So that suggests that it's really in the right vicinity to carry out this regulation. And indeed, that peak of SELF2 binding exactly overlaps the, where the CF1M25 and CSTF proteins bind globally across transcriptome. So can we, can we show competitive inhibition? So again, we went to a model system in which uh, this was a, a, from a three prime UTR that we knew was regulated in response to T cell activation. This is the um, site of the main site of recognition, what's called the, the polyadenylation hexamer, the site of cleavage. But then importantly, these enhancer elements, the UGUA and a downstream GU-rich sequence, um, which are the binding sites for CF1, M25, and CSTF. And as you can see, both of those sequences overlap with known CLIP um, known binding sites for self 2 as indicated by our in-cell CLIP study. And so in the test tube, the first question was, can these proteins um, compete for one another? <coughs> so again, we use this UV cross-linking assay, but in this case, we're not using nuclear extract, we're using purified protein. And so in the first lane here, we just have this CFM125 that cross-links robustly to a radio labeled version of this RNA. But as you can see, as we titrate in self 2 protein, self 2 very rapidly at, at um, sub molar levels, competes off the binding of CFM125 um, and, and preferentially associates with the RNA. And we see essentially the same thing when we use CSTF64, again, CSELF2 can competitively inhibit the binding of that protein. So is this, this leads to a model where SELF2 is coming in, knocking off these auxiliary factors, which would result in breaking up the whole complex, leading to a loss of that polyadenylation site. So is this actually functionally relevant, this competitive binding? So we put the same sequence um, this is actually the native three prime UTR that it's in, where it is a proximal pass site um, that uh, is preferentially used under low self two conditions. And um, what we see is that if we transfect in self two, this is a three prime race assay looking at whether we see cleavage and polyadenylation at this proximal site here versus the distal site here. And what you can see is that when we transfect in self 2 we get a shift from using this um, proximal site to the distal site. And that's specific for self 2 because control proteins don't do the same. So we see this shift when we add in self 2 So we also did the converse experiment, <coughs> looking at, um, at knockdown as well as stimulation. We see again in these are, so this first experiment was done in uh, 293 cells, which lack self 2 altogether. So that's a good sort of null control, but taking it back to the T cells in the more biologically relevant system in wild type T cells under resting conditions or non-stimulated conditions, we again see sort of equal use of the proximal and distal pass sites. But upon stimulation where self 2 is induced, right, we get this shift toward the distal. So again, shift, shifting this consistent with the model. And we can show convincingly that this is dependent on self 2 not other things that might be changing upon activation, because we lose all of this shift to the um, downstream 
or distal polyadenylation site when we knock out self 2. And again, just like in splicing, I told you that there's a lot of alternative polyadenylation um, during T cell activation, and we wanted to know how much of that was dependent on self 2. So we repeated this analysis in cells depleted of self 2, and again found that sort of 30 to 50% of the total um, alternative polyadenylation events that we can see in the jerket cells are dependent on self 2 Okay, so the conclusion from that was one example of where we have sort of followed a line of evidence and linked a particular signaling pathway and a particular RNA binding protein to both alternative splicing and alternative polyadenylation. And just to make sure I'm not leaving you with a misconception, while we feel like self 2 explains a significant fraction of the change in gene expression that is seen upon activation of T cells, there is clearly still 50 to 60% of the splicing events or polyadenylation events which are not explained by self 2 so some of these we have linked to other pathways and other proteins, but about a third remains sort of undefined. And that is, uh, continues to be an active area of, of investigation in my lab. <coughs> but at this point, I wanna then transition to the question, does this, does this all matter, right? So we can shift splicing, we can shift polyadenylation, does that really have functional consequences on the cell? Because if not, why, why are we bothering to really understand the mechanisms? So I already hinted that we know that to some extent, the splicing events, for instance, of MKK7 are important to propagate cell signaling. I said I didn't show you all the data, but that is published, that it promotes this junk feed forward loop. We're also working on how changes in splicing regulate gene expression through changing um, epigenetic factors and um, transcription factors. But we're very excited about this new data about regulation of apoptosis. And part of why we're particularly excited about this is it ties it back to what I talked about at the very beginning, which is the um, role of co-stimulation in um, enhancing alternative RNA processing, right? So I showed this slide earlier where we see um, somewhere from 15 to 30% of genes that change splicing during T cell activation being promoted. So we get bigger changes when we um, treat the cells also with or trigger the cells through CD28. Three of those happen to be known regulators of apoptosis, caspase 9, BIM, and BAX. So BIM and BAX are um, proteins that regulate initial um, mitochondrial um, uh, cytochrome C release, um, and that ultimately causes a structural change in caspase 9, which triggers a caspase cascade leading to apoptosis. And what I'm graphing here is the RNA-seq data showing um, that for each of these genes, there's a change in splicing upon CD3, which is enhanced when we uh, treat the cells with CD28 as well. And this caught our attention because, and again, as I alluded to earlier, this in biology, this co-stimulation is one mechanism um, that determines whether, whether the cells go to anergy, which is essentially an apoptotic state, or whether they proliferate and carry out effector functions. And so linking CD28 co-stimulation to apoptosis has, has sort of um, immediate biologic implications. So the first thing we did, uh, we being Davia in this case, um, was to use RT-PCR to validate that we could see these changes. It's a bit washed out on my screen, but what I hope you can see and is quantified here at the bottom 
is that um, for each of these genes, there's a reduction in the, the psi value, meaning that we're shifting to a smaller isoform. We can also see that to some extent, at least at the protein level, Again, these are relatively subtle changes, but we see an increase in the smallest isoform of caspase 9 and of BIM um, upon activation, consistent with the change in splicing. Vax, the smaller isoform, um, is not recognized by the antibody, but we see a slight reduction in the large isoform. So are these changes functionally relevant? So it was known already that the change in caspase 9 splicing um, does remove the catalytic subunit and leads to an anti-apoptotic uh, version of the protein that actually functions as a dominant negative to inhibit apoptosis. BIM and BAX were not really understood. We could make some predictions, um, but we weren't sure whether these were true. And I'll tell you in a second that, that they are not. Um, that it turns out all of these changes um, are anti-apoptotic, so protect the cells from death. And so to show that, we, um, again, David carried out a CRISPR approach where she removed the alternative exons, essentially forcing the isoform that is induced upon activation. And so I don't know what happened here, but... Um, this is just showing the genomic DNA, um, proving that we have cut out uh, all of these exons. These, we worked with heterozygous uh, clones because that more closely mimics the sort of um, subtle changes in gene expression that we're seeing as opposed to an all or none effect. Um, so we're, we're forcing one um, allele to undergo the stimulation induced version of splicing. That's interesting. So this is what happens when you go from Mac to PC, you get frowny faces. Um, this is just uh, the same at the RNA level. So again, showing that, that even that though this, these are heterozygous for the most heterozygotes, for the most part, we're seeing um, predominantly the smallest isoform expressed for all of these genes. So then the key question is in these cells that have been modified to express the stimulation-induced isoform, what is the impact on apoptosis? So I'm not going to go through all of the data. Um, Davy has done extensive work uh, triggering cells with both campothecan and atopicide to try to trigger apoptosis, and then looking at the extent of um, the resulting apoptosis through a number of different readouts. So for instance, in an experiment where she's looking at a Nexon 5, Atopicide normally induces a high degree of apoptosis as shown um, by cells that express low uh, PI, but high in exon 5. So these are fairly early in the apoptotic pathway. But if she repeats that same experiment with the clones that express, um, that have the CRISPR modified caspase 9, we essentially block all of that um, induction of apoptosis. That's uh, quantified here um, over different time points as well as different doses. And what hopefully you can appreciate is that caspase 9, but also BIM and VAX, toggling any one of these genes was enough to at least somewhat protect the cells from apoptosis. And we see the same thing, perhaps even to a greater extent, when we trigger the cells with campothecan. And also um, had the same result when we used readouts of caspase three and seven activity or mitotracker red. So that shows that any one of these splicing events alone is sufficient to cause some protection from apoptosis. But what if? So that's not how the cell normally does it, right? The cell is changing all of these things at the same time. So in order to mimic that, what we did was used an antisense morpholino oligo. Um, this is a trick in the field where you can transfect cells with these um, 
Morpholino oligos, they base pair with splice sites and they effectively block splicing. And um, that's just shown here. This is the degree of splicing change that is induced. So forcing the smaller isoform in each case um, using these ammos. And what this allows us to do is now to do a transfection where we change all of these at once. And so when Davia does that, she used a dose of um, morpholino that caused only a relatively subtle change to the individual splicing events, giving us a relatively subtle um, protective uh, degree of protection um, to atopicide. So this is quantifying amount of apoptosis. You get less apoptosis with any one on their own. But if we combine them all together, there's now a synergistic or additive effect um, on protection, consistent with the model that changing all of these events is protecting cells from apoptosis. We know this isn't just an effect of dose of the um, morpholino oligo, because if we use other um, morpholinos targeting other splicing events, these have essentially no effect um, on apoptosis. And then again, just to say that that wasn't specific for etoposide, but we see the same um, additive effect uh, when we look at uh, protection from campus beacon. <clears throat> so in sum, what this work has shown is that, so it was known already that T cell activation causes transcriptional changes in caspase um, 8 and BCLX that lead to um, cell protection, cell proliferation, cell viability. And what we're showing now is that alternative splicing adds to this protection um, by toggling the, the anti-apoptotic to, so pro-apoptotic to anti-apoptotic activity of a number of other genes. And I'll just note that um, one of the other uh, proteins in this system, CFLIP, we um, have also found is regulated by alternative polyadenylation. We don't yet know the functional consequence of that, um, but it's something Davia is about to start working on. So with that, um, this is just, again, the summary of everything I told you, but I want to leave time for questions. So I will just um, thank the people in my lab who have done all the work. I have a fantastic group of people, um, about half of which are working in this T-cell system. The other half are working in viral-induced changes in um, splicing and polyadenylation, um, and then some various people who are working on totally different things. Um, funding agencies, and thank you all for your attention. I'd love to take questions. Thank you. Very simple switching from one isoform to another. But if I go onto the page route, favorite <coughs> gene, there might be a dozen transcripts. And do you see a, a, like a blend of maybe the breaks come off and what kinds of splicing events going on that really kind of make it look like a Right. Um, so, in, in answer to your first question, self two binds to RNA with an RRM motif domain. So this is a canonical RNA binding motif that binds um, single-stranded regions and typically makes contacts to about four or five nucleotides. Um, SELF2 has, as do most of these proteins, has three of these RRMs. They all bind a UGU type sequence. Um, so the more of those you have, the higher the affinity. And the thought is the different RRMs can sample, come on and off, and, and you increase affinity the more you have. But there really isn't a context. And 
And this is true for most of these RNA binding proteins. They're fairly promiscuous um, and fair, have fairly low specificity. And I think that makes sense um, given that many of them have to bind to exonic sequences. And so these are sequences that have to primarily maintain a coding constraint. And so you want these regulatory events to be controlled by sequences that, and proteins that can sort of adapt to, um, to a wide variety of sequences that, that can maintain coding capability. How you achieve all the specificity you need, I think probably has to do with competition. You know, certainly I showed that there are other proteins there um, that are binding along the, those same regions and, and likely they are setting a threshold or how much self two there has to be in order to, to win, if you think about it as, as a com competition of affinities. Um, so that was a long answer, hopefully that answered your question. Um, in terms of sort of how loose are the brakes on alternative splicing. So what, I'm sh what I showed was, um, an RT-PCR reaction that would capture any of the uh, splicing changes that occur in sort of a three exon window. Um, and we really only see one or two isoforms typically when we do that. If you cranked up your PCR cycles, yes, eventually you're going to see um, lower abundance species, but they're really much more uh, poorly expressed. Um, than sort of the, they're really two major isoforms. Across genes, that's probably true. So um, the fidelity of splicing is imperfect. And obviously uh, there is some degree of um, promiscuity that is occurring. But for the most part, you know, actually I would argue that most of what you see in the genome browser, a lot of that is incomplete splicing or splicing that is really low abundance. So there's danger to RNA-seq. The deeper you go, the more stuff you see. But whether that stuff is ever really making protein is, is less clear. Um, so we tend to focus on the things that we can see at low cycle number on PCR that, that is really making protein um, or really changing protein expression. Yeah, um, self too. I was thinking, well, that's uh, part of the same portion. You match on dystrophy. You have other proteins there, like you know, binding proteins. So you are buying the same type of stuff. Right. Uh, and uh, it's always this command room, uh, what really binds, how it responds, as fracture is also important. RNA is always fractured. Ways or if there's some loop forming that may influence everything else. So I was wondering if you could try to see if MBNL, the other cells are coming down there because, well, when right. you pull down, you never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so absolutely. I don't know if you could try some of these other guys yep. by overexpressing them or not really able to see yep. some effect. So, so MBNL is basically not expressed, at least in the jerkit cells. Um, so we haven't worried about that. Self-1 is expressed. I showed you the Western blot for reasons we do not understand. And I agree with you is somewhat surprising. Knockdown of self-1 has absolutely no effect. So it makes a very nice control. We knock it down very robustly and it has no effect on the splicing. And so why? because they should both be able to bind. I don't know, but you know, clearly there is a context that we don't understand that is, is making it really specific for self two. That's the other part. I was thinking where you would want to draw a line. Sure, gadgets and things. That's the difference is with your cell. Sure. Well, I mean, I'm not going to change here. Right. But if you're a macrophage or something else, or maybe that, you know, right. stay yourself, you may have to. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. Like I say, it's also Absolutely. It's about a problem line there, one line. You may want to try everything. And then when you do the uh, morpholine and your cap, um, yeah. What's the percentage? Yeah, it's really high, actually. It's 80 or 90% based on fluorescent tagging. 
um, they, they transfect much more readily than siRNAs or than plasmids. Yeah, they have less shock. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, which is why why we use them actually. Yeah, we're going to we have a low.